Hello. Welcome. I'm Olivia Mattis, representing the Sousa Mendes Foundation. Welcome to another one of our Sunday programs in our series on rescue and resistance during the Holocaust. For those of you who are new to our programs, the Sousa Mendes Foundation honors a hero named Aristides de Sousa Mendes. He was the Consul General in Portugal, of Portugal in France during World War II. Portugal was ostensibly neutral, but it had a dictator who was secretly pro-Hitler and who had issued an edict to all of the diplomatic personnel forbidding them from issuing visas to refugees. And Sousa Mendes received this edict it violated his conscience as a man of faith, a Catholic man, and he decided to violate it and to save thousands of lives, including my own family, my father at the age of seven. So it's quite a profound story. And for the past three plus years, we've been showing stories on Sundays to do with rescue and resistance during the Holocaust. Today, our attention turns to Berlin, to the story of a man named Otto Weit. And he too, like Sousa Mendes, was a hero and he too needs to be much better known. So I'm so happy to shine a spotlight on his story today. You saw a film called A Blind Hero and that film begins with a postcard. Now that postcard was a real postcard that we're going to show you now. Alice Licht, who was Otto Weitz's secretary and sighted assistant, was deported first to Theresienstadt and then to Auschwitz and then elsewhere. While she was on the, the, in the cattle car to Auschwitz, she was able to take with her a postcard and I guess some ink, a pen or a pencil. And she wrote this postcard to Otto Weit. And if you look at the right-hand side, which is uh, the inside of the postcard, you see that it is addressed to the staff of the Weit uh, workshop for the blind. And if you look in the upper right, you'll see there's no postage stamp, but it says that postage will be paid by the address E. So she had hope, she had the foresight to think that this might actually reach Otto Weit. And if you look at the other side of the postcard, at the bottom, it says, if you find this postcard, please put it in a mailbox, many thanks. So indeed, many miracles had to happen for this postcard to reach Otto Weit. And to, uh, it had somebody had to find it, uh, put it in a mailbox. Someone had to pay the postage. Someone had to read it to Otto Weit, and then Otto Weit understood that he needed to go and find Alice. So this is remarkable. The idea that one could send postage or send mail from the inside of a cattle car is a remarkable thought. So speaking of remarkable, we have a remarkable panel for you today. We have our resident historian who, who is the world's expert on rescue and resistance during the Holocaust. That's Dr. Mordechai Paldiel, who for almost 25 years worked at Yad Vashem as director of the Righteous Among the Nations Department. And he had a lot to do with the recognition of this story. And he'll tell you about that. Our second speaker is the grandson of this woman who, was, who wrote that postcard. The grandson of Alice Licht is with us, and that's Jeremy Brenner. Jeremy, I understand, means Jeremiah in Hebrew, Jeremy Brenner. And he's not only the grandson of Alice Licht, he's a former journalist, now he works in marketing, and he's coming to you from Israel where he lives in a kibbutz, along with all the other descendants of Alice Licht. And then our third speaker is coming to us from Berlin, and that's Ariane Kvazi-Groch. I hope I said that right. 
and Ariane works at the Jewish Museum of Berlin. She works there in publications and web de uh, design and web department. And she was instrumental in the founding of the Otto Weidt Workshop Museum in Berlin. And that's what she's here to tell you about today. So without further ado, Mordechai, please take the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Olivia, and uh, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, the story of Otto Weidt's help to Jews takes a long time to tell. But in light of uh, today's time limitation, I will mention the most important facets of the story. And I will start with uh, Otto White's help to Inge Deutschkorn, who also played an important role in creating the Otto White Museum. As you can see on the picture, she is uh, there on the right, Inge, and on the left is her mother, Ella. Well, they, they were left on their own in Berlin after Ella's husband departed for England, uh, but was not able to bring over his wife and daughter because the war had started in September 1939. So Inga, she was then like uh, 17, 18, and her mother were left on their own. Inga writes that uh, her first meeting with White, whom she described as a legally blind, but his gaze was, in her words, penetrating. He had a penetrating gaze. He operated the brushes and brooms workshop with the help of army contracts. The army needed brushes and, uh, and brooms, and that qualified him as an essential producer. There was also a big demand on the black market for these products. All but three of his staff were Jews. But of the 15 to 20 Jewish workers, some were semi or close to fully blind and deaf as well. And after work hours, they would return to the Jewish home for the blind where they lived. Inga Deutschkorn was referred to him by a friend uh, when she sought an, an easier job than the manual work uh, that the Nazi regime first on Jews. So at their first meeting with, uh, with Otto White, uh, he told Inga to go to the employment office for Jews, where he will also be there to speak up for other Jews as well, but he was not there to show up. So at, the first, at first, Inga and her friend, Alice Licht, who, who went along with her, were referred by the official labor office for manual labor work, with Inga sent to an IG Farben offshoot that manufactured parachute silk. She was made to stand for 10 hours in front of a rotating spindle, making sure the thread did not become twisted or teared. As for Alice, she had a history of ulcers, so she got a temporary medical relief. Now, wishing to be released herself from this difficult work, Inga put on high heels, so with the standing on her high heels for 10 hours on the job and three hours in the train to and from work, since Jews were not allowed to sit on the train, after three days, she couldn't bend her right knee. So she got a medical certificate and went on sick leave. This time, before being assigned another job by the labor office, she went to see White. He then took her to see the Nazi labor boss and with the help of a bribe, that man released her to White's care. He took her to his workshop where she found Alice already working as a secretary. And he placed Inga in charge of shipping and answering the phone. A certain uh, Werner Bosch worked as a bookkeeper. You see at the bottom in the middle, that's Inga, right? And then above Inga to the right uh, is uh, Otto White. Uh, and next to Otto White is Alice Licht. Alice Licht, that's Alice Licht, secretary. And Otto White is next to her. And uh, behind are some of the semi-blind Jewish workers. And uh, there are some others with the office staff workers. Some of them are Jews, some of them are not. And these were not blind. 
uh, behind uh, Inga is uh, the, uh, the bookkeeper by the name of Werner Bosch, uh, and uh, he was a Jewish too. Uh, next uh, shot. So here's uh, Werner Bosch on the right, and here is on the left is Otto White and Ali Schlicht, his secretary. Now, these are people that uh, Otto White did not know from before, but he met him in various circumstances, and he decided he was going to employ them. And since he had army co contracts, he was considered pretty safe, and they were safe there in his uh, 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 workshop. Now, all was uh, going well. But uh, the Gestapo occasionally staged sudden visits. And when that happened, Inga and Alice would quickly rush upstairs where the work machines were located. They could overhear White taking the Gestapo chief to show his semi-blind workers while loudly berating them. Is this supposed to be a broom? When the Gestapo men left, White apologized for the harsh language that he employed to impress the Gestapo he tried to impress the Gestapo that he was trading his Jewish workers as expected by the Nazi regime. One day, the Gestapo trucks pulled up in front of White's workshop and took his blind and deaf workers away. Some of them were married to women with no eye afflictions and on whom they depended. White left and to the surprise of his staff, came back with all of his workers from the Gestapo. How he managed to achieve this, no one really knows. He was seen walking back with them on the streets of Berlin at the head of this procession of people with their yellow stars on their aprons. He said this would probably be the last time he would be able to pull this off. When Inga and her mother, Ella, felt threatened with deportation, they were offered shelter by a non-Jewish woman whom they knew from before. And White helped out by sending a truck to help transport the household goods to the new place. However, since Inga was on the deportation list, she could no longer continue working at White's place under her name uh, because she was supposed to uh, appear at the train station. So. A solution had to be found for Inga. And this is an unbelievable story, so listen carefully. So White found the solution by being referred to a certain woman who ran a private prostitution ring. And she persuaded, that woman persuaded one of those women to give Inga her labor card under her name of Gertrude Dereshevsky in return for being able to claim before the authorities to be working in White's workshop instead of being assigned some other labor. But actually, she wanted to continue to work on the street, that woman. Inga got an identical copy of that woman's card, but with her picture on it instead of that of uh, Gertrude. To the people in the workshop who were oblivious of this arrangement, Inga explained that her new name was the result of a recent marriage. All this in Berlin at the height of the deportation of the city's Jews. Now, when the parents of Alice Schlicht received their summons for deportation, White hid them together with Alice in a rented additional storage space for his finished goods, with Alice secretly continuing to work in White's office but receiving her wages in the form of food for herself and her parents. Later, Mr. Horn, one of the Jewish staff workers, was also hidden together with his wife and daughter in a secretive place in the workshop. Then one morning, the telephone rang from the police asking, do you have a Gertrude Dereshevsky working for you? The phone was turned over quickly to White who, who answered, Dereshevsky? Yes, she works there. What happened? What? She had been picked up in Hungary for prostitution? In that case, I don't want her back here. I'll send you her work papers. Thanks for letting me know. Inge Deutschkron's name was removed from all documents bearing the name of Gertrude Dereshevsky. 
This happened close to the time of the giant so-called factory action, Fabrik Action, in February 1943, when the Gestapo and the SS rounded up all the remaining Jews in Berlin. And this included white blind Jewish workers. Well, this time, white couldn't bring them back. To keep his business going and his uh, army contract and keep the six Jewish people in hiding, white employed non-Jewish blind workers. Then one day, tragedy struck again, this time to the six hidden persons. It happened when Horn, one of the hiders, stepped out and disclosed to an old acquaintance of uh, his that he met on the street that he was living and hiding in White's workshop. That man informed the Gestapo and they raided the two hiding places and deported them all, with Alice joining her parents. She wouldn't leave them alone. She was going to go with them. White rushed to the Gestapo and was able to sway them to have Alice and her parents taken to Theresienstadt, the so-called Nazi model camp for Jews to fool the Red Cross instead of being sent to Auschwitz. And he continued to send them, Alice Licht and her parents, fruit parcels. Okay, so in Theresienstadt, you could send uh, uh, packages of food and clothing. And uh, you see these are already pre-printed postcards in Theresienstadt. Uh, you see on the, on the lower left, uh, you could even send it back and it's already pre-stamped with a photo of Hitler on it. And uh, this is to Georg Licht, uh, who happened to be the father of Alice. And the other postcards is Alice uh, acknowledging, okay, here is uh, Alice. Now this is Georg uh, saying, uh, Liebe Licht, uh, but here is Alice, meine liebe Freunde, my dear friends, I acknowledge with thanks the receipt of your parcel, January 4, 1944. But as you saw at the start of this program, uh, Theresienstadt was a way station uh, to uh, uh, Auschwitz. And on the train, as you saw there, she was able to drop this uh, letter or postcard informing uh, White that she was on uh, being moved to uh, Birkenau. You know, Birkenau is, you, so, is sometimes referred to as Auschwitz number two. This is where all the gas chambers were. This is where, where most people went uh, uh, to the gas chambers and ended their life. Uh, when he learned that she was going to Birkenau, uh, then he stated before the workers, that's Otto White, I can't just let her die there. Now, this is the most fascinating part I find in the whole story. He take, took a train to Auschwitz and he somehow learned she was no longer there, but had been transferred to a certain arms factory in a labor camp in another city. He traveled there rented a room in a nearby village, paid a few months rent in advance, and every evening he went to the camp gate to watch the Polish civilian workers going in and out of the camp until one worker to whom he approached knew Alice. White bribed him and left with him some clothing, medicine, food, and money for Alice, and a message that if she escaped, he would hide her in his home. And indeed, in January, 1945, when the Russians approached and the Germans evacuated uh, that labor camp, she managed to escape from a forced march. Wearing the clothes White had left for her, she made her way to Berlin, where White and his wife hid her in their home until the end of the war. To end this short account of White's uh, Help to Many Jews, a book co-published by Inge Deutschkron in German in 1999, it was meant to educate school children on how one can maintain one's humanity even under conditions of one of the most horrific regimes in history. This by using the example of Otto White, also honored as a righteous among the nations by Yad Vashem. The man himself, partially blind, decided to help out other people stricken by the same disease, but not just anyone, but Jews, semi-blind people, 
by employing them in his broom and brushes workshop, protecting his business with contracts with the German army. All this so as to keep his business going and as what's happening and, uh, and, to, and to keep these semi-blind Jews alive and away from the deportation train as long as he could. And to save some of their relatives uh, and also people like Alice Licht and her parents. Unfortunately, Alice Licht's parents did not survive Auschwitz, but Alice did. And she was able to restart her life and have uh, married another person who came out from Germany and have a son and a grandson. And it is now my pleasure to invite Alice's grandson, Yermi, uh, to take the mic and continue with his story. Yermi, you're on. Thank you very much, Mordechai. Uh, that uh, was uh, great. I know the story very well, of course, but uh, hearing it again summed up by you was just uh, great because it reminded me of how heroic and brave uh, Otto White's actions were. I mean, I almost uh, almost forgot it. It's really, thank you very much. So, yes, my name is Yermi, and I am Alice Licht's uh, grandson. I am 43 years old, and I'm living in Israel uh, with my wife and child. We live in a kibbutz that's about one hour south of Tel Aviv, and very close to me lives also my father, who is Alice's son, Gary, and my two brothers, which are Alice's other two other grandchildren with their families. We all meet for Fridays for Shabbat dinner. And when we do that, and in general, the beautiful family life we have here, uh, I think each and every one of us understands that uh, we wouldn't have reached this without the heroic actions of uh, Otto White. And also without the result of uh, Alice, uh, this amazing woman to survive Auschwitz, to continue forward after her parents were murdered and her entire family and friends were murdered and to start a new life. So what was the most notable about Alice, uh, both as a young Berliner and later in her life was her smile. It was beautiful and she would display it frequently. In 1933, as Germany appointed Hitler to be its chancellor, Alice was 16 years old, and she aspired to become a doctor. She had grown up in a wealthy Jewish family that was well integrated in the German society. Her father, Georg, was a successful businessman. Alice's dream of becoming a doctor was, were shat was shattered when a new law significantly limited the access of Jews to academic institutions. In the coming years, the situation for Alice and her family was becoming more and more dangerous. In the pogrom night of November 9, 1938, Kristallnacht, the store of Alice's father, Georg, was destroyed. Many Jews were fleeing Germany at the time, and Alice's family also decided to migrate to England, but they could not get the visa in time. On September 1st, 1939, the war started. This picture, which was taken in a New Year's Eve party in 1941 in Berlin, shows Georg Licht, Alice's father, sitting with, a, he has a suit on and his white hair, and his wife, Kati, is on his right, and his daughter, Alice, is beside him, and many friends surrounding them. It is perhaps maybe, I like to think of it, maybe a last moment of peace and joy and normalcy amid the chaos and horror that was already emerging around them and would soon engulf them. By the time that Alice met uh, Otto White for the first time in the spring of 1941, Jews in Berlin, including Alice, were being sent to forced labors in German factories. 
uh, Mordechai talked about this, and we also saw in the movie some of the horrific situation that Alice encountered during the next five years, the next four years. And we saw Otto White's efforts to help her and many others. When I first saw this movie many, many years ago when it came out, I remember how impressed and proud it made me feel. The movie helped me understand how heroic my grandma was and also to understand how heroic other people were and the actions that they took to risk their own lives to save people like my grandma. So after the war in 1946, Alice left Germany for the US. She met my grandfather, Walter, who was also a Jewish Berliner who had left, escaped Berlin in 1937. And they weren't, they didn't know each other. And they met in the States and they settled in Los Angeles, where my father, Gary, was born in 1950. Gary grew up to be an enthusiastic socialist Zionist. And as a young adult, he decided to immigrate to Israel to live on a kibbutz. In the photos here, you can see Gary and Alice and Walter during one of the first visits of Alice and Walter to Israel to visit their son. In 1973, Alice and Walter decided to settle in Israel to be close to their son. And I was born in 1980. This picture shows me and Alice when I was about three years old. I grew up in, on the kibbutz where my dad settled, where my mom grew up, was born and grew up in, and where I live until today. It, was, it is located near the city of Rehovot, where Alice was living with Walter. I have few memories of Alice. I would see her mainly on the weekends when she visited the kibbutz. I remember her being warm and caring. I also remember my father showing me a number tattooed on her arm and telling me a story about a horrible place called Auschwitz. Alice mostly avoided talking about what she experienced. On the inside, she was probably heavily traumatized and scarred. But towards the outside world, her smile was shining and frequent as it was before the Holocaust before Auschwitz murdered her parents and her family and her friends. She passed away in 1987 when I was seven years old. So most of what I know today about her life, about the life of my grandma and my entire Berlin family, did not come from her or from my dad. It is a direct result of the research done by the next speaker, Ariana, and her colleagues who first uncovered the story of Otto White and uh, ignited the process that uh, eventually led to the creation of the museum there, which tells the story of Otto White in Berlin to thousands of visitors every year until today. I am so grateful for this research because it allowed me to understand Alice's full story and not only Alice, but my entire German Berlin side of the family. For example, besides learning about the terrible fate of her family, I also learned that Alice was a brilliant poet and writer. And this is something that influenced me a lot, made me believe in myself as a writer and that she was a dedicated and brave activist who was selfless in trying to help others flee Germany in those days. From 2014 until last summer, until the summer of 2022, I was living in Berlin. I moved to live there for eight years. My son, Ezra, who is four years old today, was born in Germany and he attended kindergarten in the same city as Alice did, in the same language. During my years as a Berliner, I visited the Otto White Museum many times. It was one of my favorite places in the city because I always left it feeling inspired. 
my work, my office was located in Kreuzberg and a few blocks away from my office, two gold plates were implanted in the sidewalk concrete. Engraved on these plates are the names of Alice's parents, Georg and Kati. These gold plates are part of a famous commemoration project in Germany and throughout Europe. It's called the Stumbling Stones Project. As part of this project, the names of Holocaust victims are implanted into the sidewalk in front of their last known address, along with their birth year and the location and year of their killing. When I was living in Berlin on my way to the office every day, I would pass by Georg and Kathy's gold plates, and I was reminded of Alice's courage and determination to survive and overcome. Alice left Germany in 1946 for the US, and she never came back after that. She never wanted to come visit Germany, not even once. In 2019, my entire family convened in Berlin. Together, we learned about Alice's life and experiences. As Alice's son and her three grandsons and five great-grandchildren were visiting the Otto White Museum, her smile was present everywhere. Thank you for letting me share Alice's story. I want to pass it on to the person who is mainly responsible for the a lot of what I know about Alice. Uh, Ariane, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Yami. Um, and thank you for your family insights. And I'm very um, happy to be here. Thank you so um, for the invitation to speak here today. You have uh, now heard and seen the story of Otto White and his workshop, but you haven't yet seen the place. Or let, let's say you, you saw the last um, photo from the um, backyard of, of the Otto White, where um, Yami's family photo is placed. Um, that is where I will take you now and tell you how we started almost 25 years ago to develop an exhibition there in the center of Berlin and how it became a museum in seven days. Uh, since I'm obviously not God, the seven days with us were more like th three years, but so that the presentation does not become too long, I will only tell you about the seven most important days <laughs> of the story. Well. How do you start a museum in seven days? Day one, having an idea. First of all, to give you an idea of the place here, you can see the backyard where Otto White's workshop existed on the left. Um, and I had the idea to study museum studies after high school. I loved his history and found it fascinating to tell stories, not in books, but in special places, perhaps unique places, using objects making exhibitions, um, that was the idea. And at the end of my studies 25 years ago, we were given the task of creating an exhibition on the subject of monuments, Denkmal, as you can read um, on the right. Here you can see the official plaque for monuments in Germany. The word Denkmal can be understood in two way ways. First, the monument that stands on a pedestal in a town square and commemorates an important person or event. And second, Denkmal as two words means think about, can be re read as a request to think about something. I did the second and I realized I didn't want to tell a story that has already been told, but to make visible something that has not been told yet. Who would join in? Day two finding allies. We were six students of museum studies who developed the idea together. Here you can see us with our professor. One of us is missing, Martina. She, she took the picture. Yeah, on the right, that's me. <laughs> um, and there are two um, girls, Anja and Kai and Ludwig on the left. And in the front is my professor, Angelika Ruge. Um, we were able to inspire all the, our other students from the Potsdam Film Academy who filmed interviews for us. We also worked with students of graphic design who designed posters and flyers to promote our exhibition. 
but the most important allies became the witnesses who told us their stories. Among them was Inge Deutschko, and she became our most important supporter. More about that later. Here you can see the book cover of her autobiography, I Wore the Yellow Star, which she first published in 1978, but this cover is newer. Day three, finding a story. There were many stories to discover in Berlin in the 90s because one half of the city, the East, had not been redeveloped. Houses that might have been demolished in West Berlin left traces of the past with their damaged facades. And there were, were people who had never been asked to tell their story. More about that later. The story of the workshop for the blind was not completely hidden because Inge Deutschbrunn had mentioned it in her biography. The Berlin Senate had honored so-called silent heroes in the 1950s. Otto White was one of them. Here you can see, you can see his grave of honor in Berlin Seelendorf at the right. It says, as head of the workshop for the blind, Otto White became a helper to Jewish people in the, their greatest need. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, Inge Deutschkron arranged for a plaque to be placed on the house of the workshop for the blind. You can see the plaque here in the photo on the left. Here's the, the translation. In this house was Otto Weitz's workshop for the blind. He worked in the years 1940 to 1945 with mainly Jewish blind and deaf mutes. At the risk of his life, White protected them and did everything to save them from certain death. Several people owe, owe their survival to him. We were curious who were the people who worked here and owed him their lives. Day four, finding a place. The place came to us. We didn't have to look for it because a student from our group, Anya, had done an internship at a gallery in the same building where Otto White's workshop for the blind existed. So Anya walked past the memory plaque every day and listened attentively when the gallery owner told her that the rooms of the former workshop for the blind were empty. We made an appointment to visit the rooms and were delighted and disappointed at the same time. There was no need to uncover the traces of the past because the rooms looked as if no one had renovated them after the war. The disappointment was in heaven and on earth. Through the holes on, in the roof, you could see the sky up to the stories of the house. The workshop was exposed to the weather and the traces of history threatened to disappear. On the floor of the workshop, residents had left things over the past five decades, it seemed. Not discouraged, we arranged the, with the association which had rented the house. The deal was that they would take care of the roof while we, we, we cleared the rooms of debris and junk. No sooner than it was said that this was done. Here are the proof photos. You see me on the left. And in, in the back, you can see a small window that was uh, where the, uh, the Horn family, Mordechai already mentioned the Horn family, they were hidden there in the last room. Day five. Besides finding supporters, besides our families and friends, we found supporters in many ways. People who volunteered to keep the exhibit open, other students who gave tours with school classes, visitors who brought us old photos. And I already talked about the most important supporters, the witnesses who untrusted us with their stories. What an important role Inge Deutsch played has already become clear. I can at some points in a moment. But first, I would like to tell you about Hans Ifraelovich. You can see him with his wife, Annelies, and at the opening of the exhibition. And in red, is it's Inge Deutsch from back. Like Inge, Hans survived in hiding in Berlin but remained here all, all his life and lived in East Berlin. One afternoon in 1998, he was driving to Hackescher Mark, the station near to the workshop. Hence, Hans had heard on the news that the courtyards Hackescher Höfe had been redeveloped. He and his wife wanted to take a look at them. After visiting, he remembered that he had worked nearby for a time in a workshop making brushes during the war. 
So the older couple came into the courtyard at Rosenthaler Straße. At the same moment, I came into the courtyard too, all dusty and in work clothes to dump debris from the workshop into a container. I looked briefly at the two of them and immediately thought, surely they can tell us something new. I asked if they knew the house and Hans answered, I used to work here and pointed to the second floor up to the rooms of the workshop. I couldn't believe that. It, what a coincidence. Hans came back to this courtyard for the first time after 55 years and we meet at each other. Hans was very touched. We walked through the workshop together and I asked a thousand questions. Hans told us in further meetings about his story. Nobody had asked him before the Berlin Wall came down and until that day we met. It did him good to tell and it did, did us good to listen. Hans also contributed two important original objects that we that were able to show already in the, in the first exhibition, his yellow star and a brush that he had made in the workshop. You can see it here. To hear more stories, I went to Israel, went to Israel in 2003. I met survivors who had either worked in the workshop for the blind or were otherwise acquainted with Otto White. They told me their stories and brought new details to light. It was also on this trip that Yami and I met for the first time at Kibbutz Hatzor. His, brother, his grandmother was Alice Licht was the link. Day six, finding a funder and an in institution. Our original plan in 1999 was to have an exhibition for four weeks, not to create a museum. But there was tremendous interest in the story and in the place, and we and Inge Deutschbrun wanted to go ahead. There were many idealistic supporters. Inge Deutschbrun invited the right people, the important people. The federal president, Johannes Rau, seen here on the right with Inge, the Israeli ambassador at that time, Avi Primor, and the minister of state for culture and media, Michael Naumann, which you can see here on the left side of the photo. And last but not least, Michael Blumenthal, the founding director of the Jewish Museum in Berlin. The enthusiasm and there, um, was there and the timing was right. So it happened that the Jewish Museum in Berlin took over the exhibition at the branch in 2001 and I found my employment there. As time passed, the idea came to tell more stories about so-called silent heroes like Otto Weid and about the resistance, not only the helpers, but also the Jewish people themselves, that they evaded the deportation by the Nazis. So the political decision was only logical that the German resistance Memorial Center became the sponsor of the blind workshop and founder of the Silent Heroes Memorial Center since 2005. I left in 2012 after more than 10 years at the Museum Otto Weiss Workshop for the Blind. Since then, I have been working at the Jewish Museum in Berlin, creating educational and digital projects. I was also involved in the creation of the Children's Museum Anua, which opened in 2020. After all, I already knew how to find a museum in seven days. Day, day seven, rest and let the visitors come. Today, I go myself as a visitor, as you can see, to Otto Weitz's workshop for the blind, and I'm pleased that the museum has 70 to 90,000 visitors a year. I can sit back and rest regarding this museum, but at any time, in any place, there are stories that want to be told and heard. Maybe I'll be there again when a museum is founded. Maybe the Silver Manage Museum in Portugal. Yami yeah, and Mordecai, would you join me? Yes, I thank would. You. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, thank you to our fabulous panel and audience. Uh, I see that some questions have started to enter the chat box. May I encourage you to keep putting questions in the chat box. The next five minutes, I'm going to be making some announcements. We're going to see a trailer of an upcoming program. And this is a perfect time for you to formulate your questions and put them there in the chat box. And then I will ask them to our speakers. So right now, let me tell you what we have coming up. So of course, we have the Jewish holidays. The next program will be in mid-October, October 15th. 
And that's an extraordinary program that we're going to have. Another extraordinary program maybe, uh, uh, after this extraordinary program today. Um, so the one in October tells a, a, a history that people don't know about, which is that the Holocaust was not purely a European af affair, but it actually extended into Northern Africa. There are four countries in Africa that had concentration camps that were run by Nazi Germany and Vichy France and even fascist Italy. And in these countries of Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, uh, and I know I'm leaving one out, four countries. Libya. Libya. There were local Arabs who rescued Jews from these Nazi concentration camps. Who knew about this? Well, there's one man who made it his life's mission to find out, and that is Robert Satloff. And it's a quest that started, uh, tomorrow we have the anniversary of 9-11, September 11th. Well, in September 11th, 2001, when the tragedy occurred in New York, that was the beginning of the quest of this man, Robert Satloff, to find a way for the Western world and the Arab world to find common ground somehow. And so he made it his quest to see if he could find Arab rescuers of Jews. And he found a lot, enough to fill a whole book and a film, which you will see. So on that program, we're going to have Robert Satloff. We're going to again have Dr. Mordechai Paldiel. And we're going to have uh, an Israeli man, a former ambassador, former Israeli ambassador to France. Nisim Tzvili is his name, who was born in Tunisia and who was himself rescued by an Arab family during World War II. So that is a program you will not want to miss. Let me briefly tell you what we have coming after that, and then we'll see a, a little trailer for the Arab program in just a minute. Um, so after that, we have other exciting programs culminating in our last program of the year in December, where we're going to meet the famous Nazi hunters, Serge and Beata Klarsfeld. These were the people who brought Klaus Barbie to justice. Uh, they documented the story of the Holocaust in France and the role of the Vichy government in helping the Nazis perpetuate the Holocaust in France. They documented the lives of the Jewish children who had been uh, murdered in the Holocaust in France. Uh, and today they continue being very active in speaking out against the, the rise of the far right various far-right political movements all across Europe and really around the world, the Klarsfelds are there at the forefront of speaking out uh, and speaking up about the danger of such political movements. So I'm super excited to be presenting them to you at the end of the year with a new film about them called Klarsfeld, A Love Story. But first, we have the program about the Holocaust's reach into Arab lands, and for that, we're now going to show you a little trailer. On a hill in Jerusalem, a haunting memorial commemorates the thousands of Jewish communities destroyed in the Holocaust. <laughs> The names of Europe's lost ghettos are engraved in our memories. But the story of what happened to Jewish communities in Arab lands is largely forgotten. Further up the hill, a tree-shaded garden preserves the names of non-Jews who risked their lives to save Jewish lives. People like Oskar Schindler and Raoul Wallenberg. They are known as the righteous among the nations. But for the writer and historian Robert Satloff, one nation is strangely absent. More than 20,000 non-Jews here, recognized for helping, saving Jews during the Holocaust. There's about 60 or so Muslims. Here's uh, Albanians. 
uh, Bosnians, and there's a tree planted up on the hill in memory of the one Turk. Strangely though, out of more than 20,000 names, there's not a single Arab. If Arab Schindlers ever existed, it might change how Arabs view the Holocaust and how Arabs and Jews view each other. This is the story of one man's quest to find an Arab who saved a Jew. So after today's program, you will receive an email with information on how to sign up for that program, and I hope you will. And also on that same email, there is a donate button. So if you like what we do, if you think it's important, please continue to support us. We rely on your help. Now to your questions. Here's a question. When did Otto Weidt initially establish his workshop? Was it before the war or was it specifically established in order to employ and save Jewish workers? Who would like to answer? Ariana, do you know the answer to that? Yeah, he uh, first opened a blind workshop in Kreuzberg in um, 36, I think. And um, in the in for, in the year forty, he moved to um, the Rosenthaler Street, where it was un until the end of the war. But but the, but the, but what's interesting is when you have a workshop, when you open a workshop, you usually hire people who are healthy, sound. They can hear, they can see, they have a good appetite. You don't hire people who can hardly see, especially when you're manufacturing brooms and brushes for the for the army. So the beautiful thing about this is that when 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 uh, in 1941 or uh, 1941 when the deportations began in September October 41 the deportations of Jews began uh, from Germany to Poland, and he decided he was going as his workers to have persons who were not qualified for any type of factory work and to produce the brooms and brushes for the Wehrmacht, the German army. And they were quite satisfied with, with how the brooms and brushes came out. In fact, he, they placed many more orders with Odevite. That's the beautiful part of him, uh, of this uh, workshop, of the brooms and brushes workshop. So two questions. One is, what happened to Otto Weidt after the war? And a related question is, did Alice ever keep in touch with Otto? I mean, was there a relationship continuing? And also, third question, what was the nature of their relationship? Because in the film, it seems like some sort of a love affair, but maybe uh, that's not the reality. So those are the questions. What happened to Otto? And then what about their connection after the war? Uh, there, there was no uh, evidence of any love affair, but there was a deep affection. Uh, as uh, Jeremy pointed out, Alice loved to write poems, and so did Otto. And some of these poems, uh, I remember when uh, Gary came to see me, he showed me some of them. They were translated into uh, uh, English. Uh, they both wrote in German. And some of them were even translated into Hebrew. Beautiful poems about uh, everyday life, about everything beautiful in life. Uh, sure, uh, Otto was attracted to uh, Alice, was attracted to Inga. Uh, he was an, outspoken, an outgoing person. He was attracted to human beings, to lovely human beings, maybe because Alice had a special smile. Uh, Otto himself was married. He didn't have any children. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting when Alice left for America and two years later he died. He died in 1947, I believe. And, uh, but they, uh, I believe they still corresponded a little bit uh, for a while. But Alice decided that she has to start a new life and to start a new life in a very different place, far away. That's the only way she could cope with that. So uh, there's nothing about people trying to surmise about a romance. There was no romance. There was a lot of affection because that was the personality of Otto White. 
So there's a question about Otto's blindness. Was he blind from birth or did he become blind? How did he manage to navigate the streets and get himself all the way to Auschwitz? I mean, who, who can tell us more about that? I can do. Um, he, he became blind in his 50s and um, he was only nearly blind. So he, he could orientate him, himself. And um, and I just want to uh, um, mention something about brooms and brushes. This is a, um, really a work um, traditionally for blind people because they have um, they are very sensitive with um, their fingers to um, make brooms and brushes. Um, so this is um, really a, a workshop for the blind until now. Um, they they make brooms and brushes. Yeah. There's a question about the headstone on the honorary grave or the symbolic grave of Otto Weit. There's some sort of a symbol on that grave. And I'm wondering if anyone can tell us more about that. What is it with the hands? And what is all that? I don't know. I would say two hands and the sun, but... I'm not sure. Okay, good. All right, well, we're getting to the end of the hour. So let me turn to each of you for some final thoughts, starting with you, Ariane. Yeah, thank you. Um, for me, the story of Otto White's workshop for the blind is also a painful story for Germans because it shows that helping was possible. If there had been more Otto White's or Sosa Mendes, history would have been different. But there's also a wrong reconciliatory, reconciliatory aspect. Um, the witnesses and my generation found each other. And, and the story of Otto White um, also gives courage because it shows that each of us can help even if we are blind. Jeremy, do you have something to say to our audience? Um. I think uh, beyond, of course, the family angle and, and my connection, personal connection to this, just inspiring to see a human that in a very, very uh, difficult situation uh, was willing uh, to risk his life uh, for uh, another human and even across religions and for many other humans. I think uh, that's something uh, we can all learn from. Thank you. Mordechai, the last word goes to you as usual. Okay, I was thinking uh, before the poem went on, what is the significance? What can we learn from that? And I'm, 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 I will start with Alice. How did Alice survive all these tra travails? Uh, okay, um, Marion Schott, all right. Uh, uh, that was like a, a model camp. Theresienstadt, I'm sorry. But then Auschwitz. And then that uh, labor camp in, in the city called Christianstadt, which is now part of Poland, and it has a different name. And then what is not mentioned, when Christianstadt was evacuated by the Germans, because the Russians were closing in, the workers went on a death march, on a march to the interior of Germany. Now we know about what these death marches were. Most people on the death marches did not survive. What made Alice, what, what is it that she's the undernourished and starved Alice, uh, not a physical, not an athlete, I think because she knew there was a person out there in Berlin who cared for her survival. The very fact that she learned that this man, Otto White, who had no business taking a train to Auschwitz, of all places, to look her up. I never heard there was there's no stories like this. He goes to out. He could have been arrested and himself wound up in a gas chamber there. And then he goes to uh, that uh, labor munitions factory, and uh, he, he he makes contacts with her, sends her medicine, clothing, food, and a message. If you manage to get out of here anywhere, you got a place back in Berlin will hide you. And I think that is the vitamin. That that is that caused it. Why do I say that? Because I remember reading Ellie Wiesel's book. 
and he was in Auschwitz. And he saw American planes flying over Auschwitz to bomb some factory out there, but not Auschwitz. And Eddie Wiesel writes, I looked up and I said, and the other said, please bomb us, bomb us, bomb the gas chambers. But uh, they, these planes, no, they were out to bomb some uh, uh, factory that was uh, produce, uh, producing uh, uh, synthetic oil and synthetic rubber. The tragedy of the Holocaust is not just Hitler and the SS. It's that the good guys did not care. And the people in the Holocaust, they felt abandoned. And when you feel abandoned, you give up hope. And Alice Licht survived because she did not feel abandoned. She knew there was somebody out there that she could go. And that's why she did not give up. And if you don't give up, then you survive. If you have somebody that you know that cares for you, and that's the beauty of otherwise. He wanted to leave her a message, don't give up. Don't give up. If you manage to, to somehow to escape, you got a place where to go, right here, me and my wife. And one day she managed to escape and with the clothes that he gave her, he already provided her with the clothes that she could uh, somehow dissimulate her prison garb, she, she could throw away. And she walked at night and into Berlin and knocked on his door and she probably fainted. And, and, and they helped her to survive. So the message is that if there are people like Otto White and that they can send a message saying, we care for you, we think of you, you can help others to make it and to survive. And that's the beauty of Otto White uh, in this story. It's a blind people, yes, but the fact that he went out and he said uh, to the people when he went to Auschwitz, I cannot allow her to die. The only way he could save her is to tell her, I, I care for you. And if you manage this, come, come out and come to my place and we'll find a way. And, and that's, that gave her the strength to survive. And that's the beauty of this story. Wow. Well, thank you to my fabulous panel. And I certainly learned a great deal. I had never heard of this man, never heard of this museum. I think all of us on our next trip to Berlin will be making a pilgrimage to that museum. So thank you, Jeremy, Ariane, and Mordechai 